Well, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This is Whitfield Harrington, and I want to welcome you to the Whitfield Harrington Show tonight. This is a show where we take a look at what's going on in our natural world, and we try to see it through a set of spiritual lenses. So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to address some things that we see going on in our world today. So we want you to put your prayer cap on and pray with us tonight, all right? Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for this show. We thank you now for the Word of God that you have placed in my spirit. I pray now that as I move forward with this show, that your spirit will go before me, that your angels will keep me and protect me from all things that you desire for us to be kept from. We ask you now, God, that you would even soften the hearts of those, O oh God, whose heart needs softening, O oh God, and that you would turn the hearts of those in the direction that you choose is best. So we thank you for these things now, and we praise you for them. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. There are some things um, that sometimes when you, you try to figure out how to talk about them, you really don't know how to approach the subject. And um, this is one of those times when I kind of feel that my thoughts are, uh, cover a wide spectrum of things that I see going on and how to connect the dots is a little tricky. The one thing that I do know is I have to pose it to you like this. Um, there's a difference between looking and seeing. Let me say that again. There's a difference between looking and seeing. And let me reduce that to the lowest common denominator, all right? There's somebody right now in the world somewhere that's looking for some money they lost, all right? But they don't see it. So what am I saying? What I'm saying is this. There can be a lot of things going on in the world that you're looking at, but you really don't see what's going on. And that's something that concerns me. Because... We're living in a time when we need seers. All right? Well, why is that? Because the Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, we're often um, associated that text with um, an overall plan for how we're going to move a group of people forward. And that's true. But... If a bus driver can't see, people will perish. If a um, train conductor can't see, in all likelihood, people will perish. But what happens when you have leaders who can't see? And when I say see, I mean spiritually. Because when you're in the midst of a spiritual challenge, and you can't see spiritually, then it's like getting on a bus with a blind man driving. And then there is no safety and security in numbers. So let me say let me say this to you. Three hundred million people or three hundred million blind people can't see any further than one blind leader. You can have fifty Blind followers, they can't see any further than one blind leader. It's all the same. I'm even reminded of a, um, a story that called, um, what was it, um, The Valley of the Blind. Of this story um, where this man was supposedly on a mountain and he slipped down the mountain and fell into this valley and everybody in the valley down there had one common thing that was wrong with them. They were all physically blind. It's a whole community of people nobody could see. All right? And this man assumed, wow, this is a whole community of people. They do everything. Talk to one another. Function. Do everything the way they're supposed to do it. And he looked at them and he seized the opportunity and he said to himself, in the valley of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. He figured because he had two eyes 
And all he needed to be one eye. If he had one eye, he could rule over these people because they were all blind. <laughs> you should look that story up. And I'll, I'll cut down to the middle to, to kind of give you the end of it. Because at the end of the story was, he, he supposedly started liking this young lady. And he wanted to confess to her that he could see. He had eyes. He could see everything. He could see the colors of the trees, the, the grass, all of these wonderful things. And she was a little confused, so she took it to the elders of the community and told them that this man says that he can see. And they're like, come together, and the elders finally came to the conclusion of what the issue was with this man. They told this man, you have a disease. And your disease is called vision. <laughs> and in order to cure your disease so you can be like the rest of us, you need to take your eyes out. <laughs> And so now he's forced with a choice. Does he want to continue to abide among the people? And they tell him the only way we will let you marry and be amongst us is you have to give up your vision. You have to give up your ability to see. And I thought that was one of the most fascinating, thought-provoking tales I've ever heard. That he thought that he could rule over a group of blind people because he could see. Well, we live in a, a generation now that we have a lot of leaders, but we don't have many visionaries. And let me explain to you the difference between a leader and a visionary. A leader can stand up and take control of a crisis. Okay. But a visionary can see the crisis coming and can tell you A, B, and C needs to be done. If not, then you can expect problems. And let me share with you what I mean. When you look in the Bible at Pharaoh and Joseph, Pharaoh was the leader of Egypt. Joseph was somewhere in a prison. All right? The leader had a dream that troubled him. And then all of a sudden, Joseph has the vision to be able to look at the dream and to see what's going to happen 14 years down the road. So now Egypt switches. Pharaoh had the common sense that if this man can see 14 years down the road, then perhaps we better listen to him. So he installed someone with a vision. And for the first seven years, they start storing up grains. And just as it was spoken, the famine came. The famine came and there were seven years of famine. So 14 years. The ability to interpret one dream secured Joseph's credibility for 14 years. It secured the safety of Egypt for 14 years and many years to come because of that. His ability to see what was coming. Now, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because I see stuff coming that you don't expect people who can't look into the unseen and see the unseeable. Because there are people who can look at things and all they see is what's on the table. But there are people that God gives that can look at something and can tell you that don't jump and shout over this stimulus package that's just been passed. I'm not in a place to where I can stand in front of the president and everybody and, and say what I really want to say. But let me tell you something. One of the worst forms of pain that can be inflicted on you is to be inflicted by someone who's, tr who's legitimately trying to help you, okay? 
it's one thing to be hurt by somebody that hates you. But when somebody comes in with the intent of trying to help you and they accidentally hurt you, worse than it would have been if they didn't try to help you. You know, that's like going to a church and the pastor is, is doing everything he can to help you and he legitimately thinks he's helping you, but he don't realize he's had something twisted in the scripture and ultimately he's hurting you, you know? And so I look at leaders and they can't see what they're about to do or what they've just done. I'm like, oh my God. Sometimes they just don't see. And then God will show me this. Okay, let me see if I can get you to help me interpret this dream, all right? For the past two weeks, I keep seeing corn. Like just bushels of corn in a, in a basket. And I saw it again like two nights ago, some corn being cut up. Like, then one night I saw outside the house this big old fat cow, all right? One cow. The cow fell over dead. Now, what do you think that means? Oh, wait a minute. What did Pharaoh dream about? Let's see. Corn and, that's right, cows. What do you think it means? <laughs> oh, it means that we're actually headed to a place to where leaders don't even understand that they're about to create a catastrophe in the intent of trying to help us. They're about to create a disruption in the food supply. They don't see it. They can't see what they're doing. And it's it's I don't understand, but I, I, I do understand that there's a difference between a leader and a visionary. All leaders can't see. They can't see that A is going to be followed by B and B is going to be followed by C. They can't see that when you give a family of five people $4,000 all over the country that they're going to immediately run out to the store and buy the stuff up. They can't see that the production level of all the people around the country has been diminished because you got everybody at home. Now all of a sudden you're going to have this big influx of billions of dollars going out to buy things and people are going to snatch the things that are most critical to survival. You can't go in Sam's Club now and get tissue. You can't even get it off of Amazon. You know? And then what happens when you give people thousands of dollars and you say, go spend it? They're going to spend it out of fear. They want to stock up. It's like you're throwing fuel on the fire because you're trying to do it in a way that you not see. Hear me and hear me well. If anybody got some pull, what you need to do is you need to stagger this money coming out. Because if you don't do it, I assure you, I see it. It's going to create a shortage of food. And it's going to do it not just in one country, but around the world. Immediately. Now, here in the United States, they give out what's called, um, what is it, SNAP benefits, food stamps. They, do you realize they don't give everybody food stamps on the same day? They stagger it. If your last name starts with, with A, you get it on this day. If your last name starts with, with G, you get it on that day. If your last name starts with M, you get it on that. They stagger it. Because if you gave all of them the food stamps on the first day, they would wipe the shelves clean. And we're already in a situation to where the things now are just in a diminished state. And this is just, just one of the things that's just bothering me that, um, that people don't see. And then when I, I go to bed, I try to go to bed, <laughs> I'll take a nap. And then God shows you something else. He points out another city. And and am I permitted to say this, Lord? I was in prayer last night. 
around 3.30. And shoof, sucked up in the spirit above the earth. Lo and behold, I'm looking down to the southern portion of the United States of America. And what do I see? Hammond, Louisiana. Come on down. The judgment of God is coming your way. I don't get the calling. I just have to report it. And then God began to explain some things to me. He had me to look at some of these countries that you see at the top of the list. Some that he selected. Um, when you look at Italy, that's the Roman Empire. Spain, the Spanish um, conquerors. The UK, Great Britain. These were people that were conquerors for a long time. They were on conquest, going all over the world, shedding blood. Do you realize that in the book of Revelations, that there's a strange scene that takes place? That their Bible says that there are souls of the slain who were beheaded. And they are underneath an altar in heaven. They're underneath an altar in heaven and they are crying out, How long, O Lord? Revelations, let me just read it so you, you hear this story. I want you to hear this. All right? He says, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them were judging. And the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded. For the witness of Jesus and for the word of the Lord, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads and their hands, and they lived and reigned with him a thousand years. These people are there, beheaded. And you know what they're saying? How long, O Lord? Will you make us wait before you avenge our blood of them that liveth on the earth? These are dead people still praying. Praying against living people. When you shed innocent blood, that blood cries. When Cain killed Abel, God told Cain, the voice of your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. Innocent blood cries out for justice. And it takes a, the spiritual ears of God to hear it and to answer it. And when I begin to look at those nations, I'm like, wow, I see what's happening now. So we need to start repenting for the sins of previous generations. Now they can't come back and get it right. But there's no point in you and I having to pay a penalty for some, some somebody did years years and years ago. For an example, there was a famine in the land when David was king for three years. And the Lord and David inquired of the Lord, What's up with this famine? And the Lord told David, It is because of the bloody house of Saul. He slew the Gibeonites. So the Gibeonites were the people that lied to Joshua like they lived miles away and they lived right down the street and he formed an allegiance with them and he didn't kill them. He didn't annihilate them. He didn't go to war with them. And they lied to him, but he still kept the peace agreement with them for generations. And Saul came along and killed him. And that innocent blood, which was like shed maybe, I want to say about 70 years before the, 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 the famine actually came, it began to affect the land. And the justice was was being was screaming out, and so they ended up having to rectify the situation. How much innocent blood has been shed over the centuries by the Roman Empire, Spanish Empire, and the British Empire? And if you know all three of those 
Well, they have three things in common. They were never really defeated as the Egyptian um, pharaoh was or the Babylonian Empire or the Persian Empire or the, um, the Medes in the Bible. The Roman Empire sort of dissipated through corruption. And the British Empire was was sitting on top of the world until this, this little group of people on the other side of the Atlantic got the idea that they was going to start a democracy and tell them, told them no, no taxation without representation. And they dared to sign a declaration of independence. And Great Britain decided they would go to war with them. And these little, you know, people that wanted their own freedom stood up to a tyranny. And lo and behold, democracy was born because of that. And here we are now, where the world is being shaken by something we can't even see. And when people can't see, they take extreme measures. I mean, this 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 method of handling this thing, this this strategy. I, ladies and gentlemen, let me speak on the record. This sounds like something my grandmother would have came up with. Go in the house, shut the door. This is what you're telling the whole world to just go in the house and shut the door. Excuse me? And you want to stand in front of the world and act intelligent? Where is the thinking? Where's the vision in all of this? You know? Let's go in the house and shut the door. It'll be over in a little bit. You know, I was going in the Home Depot the other day, and I get to the door, and the guy tells me, stand behind him. I just politely did a 360 and went back the other way. Or was it a 180? Whatever it was, I went back to my car. <laughs> I'm not going to stand here in a line to go in the store. And it's getting now to where fear is allowing something greater to test the limitations of how well we would submit to s uh, subtle control. Shut down the entire country, excuse me. I can't help but look at numbers. I can't. When I look at how many people have died in China, 3,000 people. And I look at how many people die every year in the United States from the flu, about 28,000. And I said, we have a flu vaccine. China didn't have a vaccine for this thing, and we still don't. And here it is, a group of people that didn't know anything about that thing has kept it to a minimum control to where it hasn't even risen to the same level of the flu. And so the best way to handle this thing is we got to tell the whole world to go in the house and shut the door. Don't stand next to nobody. Don't congregate to do this. Mr. President, I think it's time to reevaluate how we handle that situation. And to the leaders of the, of, of, of the free world and even the, those who are not even free, I think you all really need to stop and think what you're doing. You're looking at what you're doing, but do you see what you're doing? I respect doctors, but let me say something to you. Doctors know medicine, not economics. It's hard to get through medical school. It is. I've seen those books. They're like that thick. You got a bunch of them. And you have to study medicine. And a lot of times, people have the tendency to give you advice through a little peephole. And that peephole may be from the little medical thing that they stare in your ear with. I don't know the name of it because I don't know medicine. All right? But there's this little thing when you go to the doctor, they stare in your ear. You can't see the whole world through this little device, through a peephole and try to make decisions for the entire world through the eyes of a doctor. I respect the medical profession, 
But I cannot allow myself to sit silent and pretend that it's okay. Because now people are starting to question whoever this guy is. Well, doctor, when can we do I mean, I mean, it's 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 got to be to a point to where we gotta say, do you see this? I mean, do you see this? <laughs> You've been looking at it, but do you see? Do you see they have told the whole world to go in the house and shut the door? This is how we're going to deal with this. This is, I mean, this sounds like my grandmother who was dead and in her grave, who was in Itabina, Mississippi, that always had those scriptures on the outside of her door, all over the yard, that my mother said, people are going to think you're crazy, mama, because you got all these scriptures. Oh, she said, that's exactly what I want them to think. I'm crazy. And she had one scripture that hung on her door. And anybody that's from Itabina, Mississippi, even Jerry Rice, who went to school, that probably knew my grandmother's yard, okay? She had one scripture on the mailbox that said, prepare to meet thy God. And I still remember that as a little boy. And so I think now we better start praying for leaders and that God would open their eyes to see what's really going on, and to be bold enough to say, wait a minute. Sounds good, but I see it a different way. I don't know. There's so much more. I almost need an hour tonight. There's so much more I could talk about that it just troubles me. But be praying for me. Be praying for yourselves. And uh, go put you some food in your, in your pantry. Don't panic. Just be wise. And um, don't say you ain't been warned. <laughs> Somebody asked me, well, how do we tell people without creating pandemonium with them going out buying? If you said that God is showing you that it's going to be a shortage of food, I said, go get yours first. <laughs> That's how you do it. Go get yours first. And then if they decide to panic, you can just say, Lord, help them. Maintain your peace. Be in a place to where you can see what's coming. And you don't have to be caught behind the tornado that's coming tomorrow. You're already on top of it today. I guess I'll stop there. I don't know whether I'm liking this, loving this, or just committed to doing this. I care about people, I care about the world, and things have dropped in my hands, and really, you know what it's like to have an angel come get you and take you all the way on the other side of the world and point something out to you? This is fixing to happen, that is fixing to happen, that is fixing to happen. Go say this, go say that. Hey. I'm just trying to make it in. So I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this night. We thank you for this word. Give us visionaries who can see into the unseen and can give us directions as we move forward. We thank you, God, that you said if we lack wisdom, ask. And so I'm asking now. And your son, Jesus, Mighty name, I pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a wonderful night. And I'll talk with you next week. <laughs>